Welcome to the Carrie Newhoff Leadership Podcast on YouTube. My name is Carrie Newhoff, and my goal is to help you lead like never before. So what I do every week is I sit down with world-class leaders and church leaders, business leaders, and I talk to them about what made them who they are and try to have the conversation with them that you would have if you got to sit down for lunch with them or have dinner with them or really got to spend some time with them. So we go into the backstory and we explore what made them who they are and some of the principles they've learned along the way. So if you enjoy this episode, I would love for you to like it, to subscribe, and also to share it with your friends. And in the meantime, here's today's episode. Well, Scott and Pat, it's a privilege to have you on the podcast. Welcome. Very good to be here. Thank you so much, Carrie. And uh, with my buddy, Scott, we're uh, happy to join. Yeah. Yeah. I'm delighted to be here as well, Carrie. Well, Scott, you're now uh, a second time guest. So first time you were on with David Kinneman as we rolled out Church Pulse Weekly. And uh, so leaders have a brief bio of each of you already, but I'd love to know, just give us like in your own words, because sometimes you get this like really complicated bio and it's like, okay, but if someone was just to ask you, what do you do? What do each of you do? And what have you done? (laughs) Go ahead, Pat. Well, I'm a tech guy who was uh, born a farm boy, uh, came to Christ uh, young in my uh, uh, career, and uh, thought uh, God was calling me into ministry. And then he said, the workplace is your ministry. And uh, going from a little tech up to a CEO, you know, a passion for tech, but a passion for Christ and how tech can uh, truly be used to bring every person to a uh, first knowledge of uh, Jesus and him as Savior. Hmm. That's a great story. And, and some of the firms you've worked for? Uh, 30 years with Intel. Uh, and, uh, so I, as I, as I joke, I uh, went through puberty at Intel. Uh, I started at, <laughs> I started at 18 and, uh, went from the entryest level of tech, uh, up to being, uh, second in command, uh, at Intel, then over to EMC and now CEO of, uh, VMware for the last, uh, eight years. And what does VMware do? I think most, most people have heard of it. I've heard of it, but. Yeah, basically software that runs data centers. Every cloud uses this kind of software. Every data center uses us. But increasingly, we're connecting every device. We're helping people build applications. But it's really that magic that goes inside of all the tech that everybody is using every day. Yeah. And Scott, fascinating uh, bio since we've gotten to know each other over the last, uh, well, over this year, really. Tell us tell us a little bit. What do you do and what have you done? Yeah, thanks, Gary. Um, well, you know, we... Um, <clears throat> Teresa and I started, uh, you know, our career early on with some brand names like we were at Blockbuster from store number one till store five thousand, and you know had the the opportunity to be the president and vice chairman, chief operating officer there, and <clears throat> also had, as you said, you know Einstein bagels and scaled that as well as some other technology businesses that people are aware of, um, home advisors or ancestry.com involved in those. But during that whole time, we were also involved in uh, a lot of uh, different uh, ministry um, efforts, uh, family life um, to help relationships, uh, crew on on, on campus, uh, local churches, recovery. We did a lot in recovery and recovery centers. So we've just been on that dual track for the last 35 to 40 years. And 10 years ago, Teresa and I decided to full-time go focus on bringing technology and capabilities into churches, into parachurches, into recovery centers. And that's the journey that we've been on. And and then it was about, you know, six years ago that then Pat joined in that journey and Linda uh, with, with Teresa and I. And so we've been then jointly on that journey uh, here for the last uh, five or six years. Why did you make that switch? Because it's always fascinating to me what motivates people, right? You both had the level of success and you both had probably the freedom to do whatever you want. And you could easily, if you chose at this stage in life, be in a yacht sailing around the world for the rest of your days. And you've chosen not to do that. I would just love to know why you decided to do this venture with Glue, with People Connect, and and even to continue this 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 run in this direction. Um, yeah, no, it, it's simple. Uh, you know, we we feel like our 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 calling, our opportunity is to basically use our skills, our capabilities to be able to serve into these personal growth ecosystems. 
Um, there's nothing more important today in our mind than to be able to make sure that the smallest recovery center, the smallest church has got the world-class capabilities to be able to leverage the technologies that have been created for the purposes that they're trying to accomplish. And, you know, it's just, it's, it's what, what we want to live our, our lives for is to be able to make a difference for these organizations. And so that's the primary driver. And, um, you know, we've had, we've had great, great partners all along the way and great, great success uh, getting to this point. And now as we're launching People Connect, which makes it incredibly accessible to, you know, every small church and, 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 and every small organization that's out there trying to help a person grow, um, we're just excited about the moment. Uh, what about for you? What, what motivates you to get involved with an endeavor like this, Pat? Well, you know, I like to be involved in creating things that matter. And, you know, 14 generations of microprocessors with Intel helping to create USB and Wi-Fi. Literally, uh, you know, my life mission is, uh, you know, work on a piece of technology that touches every human on the planet and every modality of life. And that that may hasten the day of Christ's return, right? You know, that, that you really are touching humanity. And I've helped to create ministries like Transforming the Bay with Christ uh, here, uh, City Gospel Movement in the Bay, uh, Super Evolved with Stadia, you know, church planting across the nation, you know, things that matter. And when Scott approached, it was like, how do we bridge this world of a tech-hesitant church community but the power of technology being harnessed by the church. And to me, that was really that intersection and why we got involved with Glue. How can we help bridge that world? Because, you know, ever since the time of Christ, you know, the church has been maybe a little bit hesitant. But once again, the Great Commission was never a statement of the how, but the what. Go and make disciples. And it's our job to figure out the how to do so. And this idea of harnessing technology to help, you know, that's a passion that we uh, deeply have. You see, it's, it's really interesting what you're saying, Pat, because there were two thoughts that came together that I rarely hear together. And I'm going to paraphrase it, but you said basically take the best of technology and use it to help people uh, meet Christ or hasten Christ's return or whatever the kingdom and uh, you also mentioned that the church community is tech hesitant. I would agree with that. So I've, I've written a bunch of stuff on Church Online in 2020 since COVID. I have for a long time. I've been writing in that area. But uh, I mean, I've, I've waded through and responded to some of thousands, tens of thousands of comments this year. And I would agree. The, the Christian community seems to be a little bit, we're all on our iPhones going, I don't know whether really technology is here to stay. <laughs> Can you speak into that a little bit? Because I, I, I think it's a really fascinating paradox. Well, imagine that we're here in 1500 and our name is Martin Luther. Right. And the greatest invention of that era happened just uh, two decades before, right? The printing press. Mm -hmm. And we said, oh, you know, we really shouldn't put the word of God in printed form because it really should only come for a properly trained priest. You know, so let's not create the Bible, right? In printed yes. form in people's language. You know, that's about as preposterous as saying, let's not embrace technology to further the church because we should really only do church when we can hug you, touch you, and have the physical touch as well. Don't you agree, Carrie? <laughs> like, no, right? Yeah. You know, Martin Luther embraced the technology of the day and he changed mankind. He brought education. Right. You know, it became the foundations of the Renaissance and he broke the evil cabal of the church being used for political and power purposes. You know, that defined an entire era by embracing technology for the purpose of the kingdom. And to me, you know, as people come online and Facebooks and Googles and so on, you know, it's redefining our social networks. Of course, the church should embrace it. Right. We should passionately be saying, wow, a new way to reach people. You know, we have almost half of the population of the planet is in church restricted areas. And we're not going to use technology to reach, you know, into China oh, or reach point. into Muslim and Islamic uh, custom, uh, uh, countries. And church is limited today by the capital of the edifices that we're building. God didn't, you know, Christ didn't command us to go build churches. He said, go make disciples. Hmm. Right. You know, and to think that we're limiting by, you know, the capital that we're putting into buildings, 
right? And the whole COVID crisis to me, all of a sudden churches couldn't meet physically, right? And I think it's a bit of a kick in the pants to the church to say, of course you should be using digital technologies because your church can reach more people. You can do so more cost effectively. And literally the planet becomes part of your potential church. Wow. What's your take on that, Scott? Um, like, do you sense the reticence sometimes in certain leaders to embrace technology? Yeah, for sure. Uh, there, and and I, I agree totally with what, what what Pat just said. And 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 you know what? But what I would what I would add to it is this, Carrie. What's really important is technology has to reflect the right design. Mm-hmm. For instance, the technology needs to needs to support bring superpowers to a relational interaction right okay because it's relationship that catalyzes growth and it's relationship that causes us so most technology is built to disintermediate the person no we need to bring the technology with the design to actually bring superpowers to that relational interaction allow those raci- relational interactions to get scaled OK, that's the, that that's the, that's the difference. And when 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 I think when people start to see that 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 the design is to facilitate the relational interaction, OK, online, then offline, either way, always, then I think all of a sudden the hesitancy starts to come down because it feels right. It feels it feels real. And so, you know, I think I think that's just an important thing is that we have to bring technology into the right design in order for it to be used for personal growth and for God's purposes. Hmm. So, Pat, I mean, uh, it would be fun to have two hours with you, with either of you. And some point you'll come back solo, I hope, on the podcast. But I've got to ask, like, seriously, when I saw in your bio that you help pioneer things like USB and Wi-Fi, like that's like... People almost see that as a human right these days, right? Like Wi-Fi, <laughs> access to technology. And to think that you were actually involved in the creation of USB and Wi-Fi. I'd love for you to look back on your four decades in Silicon Valley in tech. And what have been some of the breakthroughs that you've seen? Because I've, I've been a student of Silicon Valley. I've made the pilgrimage a few times in the last few years, you know, walked the streets, saw Steve Jobs' house and, you know, uh, met with some of the, the leaders in Silicon Valley and has just been fascinated following that story. Um, but there are pivot points, times where technology takes quantum leaps forward. I would love for you just to outline a few of those for our listeners, because some of them are really young. We have a lot of young listeners here and they don't remember a time where there wasn't Wi-Fi and there wasn't (laughs) USB. And now we're talking to the guy who helped create that. Well, you know, I I think the, you know, the first one you'd have to go back and look at is truly uh, semiconductor, silicon, Gordon Moore, Moore's law. And this idea. Can you go through Moore's can, law? This is fascinating. I'm not sure everybody would know what that is, but it is it is a fascinating yeah. concept. Yeah, and basically in the earliest days when silicon you know chips were just starting to get underway, he predicted this doubling of computing power every two years, right? Which yeah. you know it's sort of like, huh, you know, you, you double every two years for a decade, and all of a sudden, right, you know, you're two orders of magnitude greater in capacity. Right. In those early days, it was sort of like, wow, you know, li- literally, if I do nothing, I'm going to get twice as much two years from now. And then mm-hmm. the next two years, and, you know, this ability has enabled us to literally when you have your iPhone in your pocket today, you have over 100 times the computing power that NASA used to get the first man to the moon. Wow. Carried in your pocket. Right. And you're sort of like, wow. Right. Literally, I can bring computing to everything. And that's what we've been seeing for the last 40 Has years. Has Moore's law held true over the years? Like it's about a doubling still? Um, it's, it's starting to flatten, right? Okay. We're hitting some physical limits uh, at this point in time, uh, which will bring us to the third breakthrough in a second, yeah. which I'll talk to, right? But the first one, this idea of being able to just radically increase computing capabilities in silicon. And, uh, you know, just, just magic what we can carry in our pockets now. You know, the second, and this is sort of where USB and Wi-Fi come in, the idea that we can connect everything, mm-hmm. right? where, you know, literally, and you know, as, I, as I say in my mission statement is that we will you know, bring technology to every human on the planet. Today, we're a little bit over 50% of the planet is now persistently connected to the internet. 
by 2030, that number is 90% of humanity will be persistently connected. You know, about 10 billion people that are connected, plus all of the things that they're connected to uh, as well, right? You know, whether it's my smart uh, thermostats or, you know, my autonomous uh, cars, we're connecting everything. So now you have, I can bring capabilities, computing to everything. I can now connect everything. And I think today we're seeing the third great breakthrough, literally, and what do you do with all that connectivity and data? And that's in the area of AI, where literally I can now bring intelligence as a result of computing and connectivity. I can bring intelligence to everything where it becomes predictive. It becomes smart. You know, I can uh, truly be, you know, oh, Carrie likes this stuff. Well, show him more of this stuff. Right. right. You know, right. This machine is starting to go out of maintenance. Let's take predictive actions, you know, for it before it breaks. Huh. You know, you're now going into a high risk neighborhood. Let's reroute you right now because there's some things going on in those street areas. We'll give you a safer route. Right uh, today, all of these things now become possible as we bring literally intelligence to everything. And I sort of joke about: imagine tomorrow morning, you know, when your smart device wakes you up an hour earlier and says you had a heart irregularity last night. You know, I needed to get you up early. I've loaded the directions into your car. You know, I've uploaded all your biomedical uh, to your physician. You know, I, we're running the complete DNA sequencing of your medical against that information. It will be fully completed by the time you reach the doctor. You know, we're running you past your favorite Starbucks on the way. I moved your order from your normal Starbucks to this one, and I made a decaf because you are going to the doctor. All those things. <laughs> all those things are in the next decade and wow. you know that type of things of touching every aspect of humanity right as we bring i think these three great you know breakthroughs together compute everything connect everything and bring intelligence uh, to everything and to me you know after 40 years in technology i think we're just getting started i'm as fired wow. up now as i was 40 years ago so I gotta, I gotta just go there. And by the way, I have in this box. I open it on the weekend. Uh, my new Series Six Apple Watch. So I think it does that whole heart rate thing. I think, I think it does. I don't know. I got my Aura Ring on, so I'm. Oh, what is that? Tell me about that. Oh, it's it's better than a watch, right? Okay. Because you know, here this is about you charge it once a week, and it includes all your biometrics, sleep patterns, everything, your know, heart rates, uh, temperatures, etc. Yeah, O U R A. You know, we're, and this is not a marketing program for. for no, 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 so, no. Yeah, to me, it's been life changing. Isn't that interesting? Now, I just, I just got to be honest with you. A lot of people would find that creepy. Um, the social dilemma came out this year. I don't know that you've had a chance to see it or not, but if you follow Tristan Harris, I'm sure you're both aware of Tristan's work and other people like that who I've tracked for a few years. People are like, "Whoa, this feels like Big Brother." Um, Scott, you and I've had lots of conversations about. Um, privacy and the importance of protecting that. Can you just um, speak into people's fears over that kind of technology and how big brother-ish it feels? Like, what do we need to be afraid of? What do we not need to be afraid of? I'd love both of your takes on that. Go ahead, Scott. Go. The, uh, you know, clearly, you know, when I think about it as three things need to come together, right? You know, clearly, you know, technology needs to protect your privacy. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, and of course, you know, hey, we need to have good security and, you know, it has to be increasingly built into uh, everything. You know, but then you need to have the public discourse as well. Right. You know, these trade offs, because it's not clear, you know, at what point, you know, if I can predict COVID, but I need to track your behavior. Right. You know, is that good or bad for humanity? Yeah. These yeah. are tough trade offs. Right. You know, and they should be properly debated uh, in it. And then you need the privacy advocates. You know, they need to be sitting at that table as well. So, you know, I have government technologists and uh, privacy or civil rights advocates. They need to sit at the table and come to the right judgments. And then, you know, whatever the specialty is, if it's a healthcare, they need to be at the table. Right. If it's financial services, they need to be sitting at the table because these things, you can't predict them a priori. Right. Because all of a sudden the new technology breakthrough happens. We then need to go through the discourse again. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and, and over and over in time as technology helps shape public uh, policy. And, you know, for that, I'll say, you know, I, uh, I chastise my own technology peers. 
you need to be far more concerned and on the front foot. We can't be, you know, as I call us cowboys, you know, you know, we're sitting over here in Silicon Valley. We do some great innovation, you know, oh, Washington might uh, do something bad to prevent our industry. You know, let's ride like cowboys and shoot them up in DC. No, right. We have to be actively involved. And I call it technology as a force for good. We have to be constantly saying, how do we shape technology because it's, you know, this pliable Plato like thing. And every day we have to be saying, oh, cool breakthrough, you know, blockchains and AI. Now, how do I make it a force for good? And we need to bring that social conscious into the very fabric of how technology is developed and how it's delivered to every consumer on the planet in every modality of life. I think it makes an interesting point, Pat, because I've thought about that. I, I uh, you know, I've been tracking this for a while, thinking about the ethics of what technology does, but also the ethics of what I do as a podcaster, author, you know, blogger, and the content gets access a lot, um, millions of times a year. And uh, I'm like, okay, so we all absent the technology sphere and that really leaves it to the bad actors, doesn't it? Is that is that mm-hmm. like a simplistic way of thinking? Like if the good people disappear yeah. from the internet, if the church disappears from the internet, if Christians disappear, <laughs> like, is that simplistic to think about that? Yeah, it, it is one of my fears and why I think church yeah. stepping back from any technology discussion actually weakens the technology view, right, you know, for that exact reason. And, hey, I think some things are bad today. You know, mm-hmm. Facebook's business model is a pariah on humanity because mm-hmm. they keep probing, probing deeper into your social network to have more accurate uh, advertising and reach. Hmm. Yeah, I have a problem with that. Yeah. Right? And so should you. Right. You know, I believe. Right. At the same time. Hey, you know, but it needs to be debated in this public policy uh, agenda to help shape it for good, because we've also seen there's so much benefit right, yeah. to being able to have connectivity and social network in the technology realm uh, as way. And, uh, you know, for that, the more we step back from it, the less influential we, the church, are in it. And that's part of the reason I said, boy, you know, I want the church to be first and foremost on these technology trends. Yeah. And it's interesting to me that, you know, when people get interviewed on this in, in, in the press or, you know, even technology publications or sites or, or documentaries, uh, there's no theologians. Like we should be leading the ethical conversation and I'm not sure we're up to it, you know? And it's really interesting to me that that theology and philosophy has now given way to uh, other factors that are, that are debating this. And it's usually ex-employees that end up going, you know, waving the flag. Yeah. And I think, you know, very much, you know, the theologians, the philosophers, the privacy experts, the politicians, and those responsible for the social fabric of our nation and business leaders. I wasn't trained as a theologian, but I'm making <laughs> theological, philosophical, and policy decisions every day and how I'm shaping technology. Yeah. And, you know, Carrie, let me just add, add mm-hmm. on. So as, as Pat and I think about, about glue and how do we bring infrastructures and capabilities into not just the churches, but the recovery centers that interact with the churches, the parachurches that interact with the churches, the community service organizations, to that entire connected network, as Pat yeah. was talking about it. You know, <clears throat> as, as we said, it's all about personal growth, and growth requires engagement, okay? Right. Engagement, we've talked about, is powered by relationship. Mm-hmm. All right. There's no relationship that works without being known, okay? You have to allow yourself to be known in a relationship. Otherwise, it's not going anywhere, right? And the foundation that sits below being known is trust, okay? Mm. So at the basis of the entire glue architecture, it is about trust, okay? Mm. Glue's infrastructures bring HIPAA compliance, like, like, for, like for a doctor's office. Yeah, we what bring, does that mean? That means that, you know, you, you have control over your data. You have to grant a a right for one doctor to share data with another doctor or with even your wife. Right. Right. And, and, and that same kind of capability consent, those consent architectures exist at glue, you know, the GDPR or the CCPA, and those are the European uh, standards and the California uh, uh, Privacy Act 
standards, we bake that into our infrastructures. Right. So when a church adopts blue, they actually gain privacy, they gain security, they gain trust, right? And that's just architected into what we do because it's one of the things that the that that, that a small church can't do on its own. Right. So it's got to be able to leverage the power of these collective infrastructures that allow them to get the privacy and the security, the connectivity that Pat was talking about, the access to the, all of that, that processing capability. And that's why we're doing blue. Well, you've both been leading at the meta level, but let me give you a little quick snapshot <laughs> that made me think about that. And hopefully this 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 helps some leaders. But when we launched Connexus Church in 2007, uh, myself and Rich Birch, who runs Unseminary, some of my some of the leaders listening will know Rich. Uh, we were on staff at the time launching Connexus, and I remember one of the decisions we had to make is where are we going to put our database? And we were just pivoting. Cloud based computing was kind of new. The internet was getting faster. It had just toggled into broadband versus dial up. And we debated: do we use an online server like store our stuff in the cloud? Or do we actually get like that big computer that sits in a room that you have to cool where we put our data? And, you know, we both kind of realized that it's probably the software in the cloud that is better protected <laughs> than a computer sitting in an office that somebody could break through a window and steal all the data from or hack us online. Like we are not privacy experts can you just comment on that for churches that are like patching their own networks together or thinking, no, we got this? Because uh, it is complicated. I mean, you get hacked, like, whew, that's a big deal. Yeah. And, you know, I've even in some of the glue board meetings, I said, you know, churches are at risk, right, of lawsuits for not handling data properly. Correct. Right. You know, and, you know, literally this could destroy, you know, entire congregations if not done properly. Right. Because, your job is to have some of the most private, intimate data associated with people. That's part of what a church does, right? You know, you know, reach them at their you know most intimate uh, levels. So against that, you know, I, you know, that's part of why why Scott's comments on Glue and how we've architected the platform put enormous effort on being on the front end of many of these uh, security privacy uh, conversations. You know, and I do think churches today. You know, if you're running it in a, a PC that's sitting under your administrator's desk and that's where your core database is, you're at risk. And moving to cloud-based solutions today, you know, it gives you, you know, literally the best security experts on the planet are monitoring those cloud environments today, seven by 24 with large teams of people and some of the most advanced technologies is far more secure than you're going to be able to do right, yourself unless you're at the highest end of sophisticated churches today, which very few are. So in this, I say, boy, you are much, much better off uh, in that regard, I'm moving into some of the cloud-based uh, service offerings, SaaS offerings, as they're called, you know, cloud services that you can be buying and taking advantage of uh, from the cloud. And again, you know, let, let some of us help, you know, Glue and others, you know, these are areas that we uh, you know, are specialists in. We can help guide the right choices uh, in those areas, but it's time to make that move. Anything else about the founding of Glue? And then I want to get into uh, some of the other things that are coming down the, uh, the you know, coming down the pike for uh, technology and churches, but anything about you and Linda joining the board or Scott, you and Teresa founding Glue that you want to add that would be relevant to leaders? Because I just think it's fascinating that uh, the two of you who could do at this point pretty much anything you want to do with life decide that your mission is going to be to provide safe technology for churches. Scott, oh, go first. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Pat. <clears throat> well, you know, it's just, uh, first of all, I think that the, the point that you make there is Teresa and Scott and Pat and Linda, um, you know, mm -hmm. this is from, from our standpoint, I know from Pat's standpoint, uh, it is uh, the two of us, Teresa and I leaning in on this. And I know mm -hmm. when we're sitting and, and, and talking with, with Pat, he's got Linda there as well. And it's like, okay, Hey, are we doing this together? You know, and it's, we're doing it not only Pat and Scott, but we're doing it as couples. And I think that's right. a a really important point. Tell uh, me why that's important to you. That is something that comes up in our conversations again and again. And I'd love to know what is your heartbeat behind that? Well, I mean, the heartbeat is God's, is, is God's design for oneness, you know, and, and uh, you know, just the simple idea that, um, 
that, you know, the two of us come together, we, you know, we become one and, you know, we complete each other and we complement each other uh, and we challenge each other in all the right ways. And so, you know, that's just, that that's just core to uh, what we are. And, you know, Pat and I were first introduced uh, by Dennis Rainey at Family Life Ministries. Okay. You know, so it, it, there is, there, there is even in, in the DNA of, of, of our, our relationship, <laughs> you know, um, family ministry that, you know, have, has brought us together. So from my standpoint, okay. yeah, go ahead. Pat. Let, let me, ju- let me jump in there, Carrie, as well, because, yeah. you know, in, uh, in my book on, uh, uh, balancing faith, family and work, the juggling act, right. You know, I talk about agree to agree, mm. right. And if you and your spouse don't agree on something, then one of you is schizophrenic, right? Because God has called you to one. And if he's calling one of you to something and he doesn't call the other, you know, in that itself, hey, you know, God is not a schizophrenic God. He's going to bring both of you there, or they're still learning for one or both of you in that decision-making uh, process. And to me, this is so foundational, right, to every relationship that, you know, God has formed in this magical ceremony of matrimony, right? You know, that truly two have become one. And in that mystery, you know, there's such great value if you partner with your spouse and every decision that you make of significance and saying, we're going to agree to agree. Yeah, it's interesting, you know, and, and I'm glad you started there, um, Scott, because I find for my wife, Tony and I, we've been married 30 years and like the next, I don't know how many decades you have left, three maybe, um, hopefully, it's a joint venture. Like we are working closer and closer together every year for shared objectives now that we're empty nesters and everything like that. So I think, I think that's a really good point. And it's like relationship goals for those of you who are early into your marriage and maybe, you know, we had a lot of bumps in the early years. So uh, there's hope ahead. Anyway, uh, that was a good excursus, but let's continue. <laughs> so uh, anyway, anything else about the founding of Glue? That's where we were going, Scott. No, we're just, you know, we're, we're just all in as Pat is um, to be able to say, hey, we've been, we've been blessed with lots of um, capabilities and experiences and access to, to resources and, and, um, you know, the intelligences and, and, you know, we just, our job, um, our, our responsibility, our stewardship is to put that to work, to be able to serve people that are helping people grow. And that's what we're doing. So this, go ahead, Pat. Two of the things I would just add to that uh, as well, you know, as we've touched on already, this idea that technology and church, you know, having a company that sits right in the nexus of that, you know, that is being led by people of deep Christian uh, conviction as well. You know, to me, that's powerful, right? Because there are churches today, you know, I, I don't believe, you know, and I'll say, say this even more. If you're a, a physical only church, I think you're dead right in the future. Right. I just don't think that you're going to be able to survive right in this increasing digitally you know, connected world. And I truly believe there are going to be two types of churches going forward. There's going to be the digital church that is digital and physical or the church that's all digital. Right. And truly, it's only embodiment and representation. Right. Is in the virtual or digital uh, world. So having a company that's truly and uniquely focused right at the apex of those two coming together was very, very important for us you know, as part of Glue. You know, and finally, I think it's our great commission objective. Right. Go into all the world. Right. You know, and uh, remember, you know, he kicked the disciples out of Jerusalem. Right. He had to bring persecution to do it. Go into all the world and the world is getting connected. How can we not be participating right in this greatest social transformation, you know, and maybe human history? You know, jump right in the middle of that. You know, yeah, I'm going to add one more thing to that. And as, as we talk about that, the, the, the network of the church goes across personal growth and it connects to everything. It's, it's secular. Okay. And it's also faith-based. So glue is serving secular organizations that are intersecting with one another, faith-based organizations, you know, and so whether you've got a recovery center out there and it's a secular recovery center, we're there to serve it. Right. Right. And if you got a church, we're there to serve it. But these things all, like Pat said, they interconnect, right? Mm. Because there is no separation. Ultimately, it is just really connectivity of a global growth, personal growth, ecosystem. And we've got to bring capabilities and we've got to be able to bring technology, connectivity, all the things that Pat talked about to serve that. 
I want to I want to shift gears for a second before we talk about People Connect, which I want to get to. But one of the things that has come up was scale, and both of you have extensive experience with scale. I mean, Intel, VMware, which is a little more business to business than business to consumer, but uh, you know, Blockbuster, Boston Market, um, Einstein Brother Bagels, uh, Ancestry.com. I mean, you guys have scaled a lot of organizations. And last time you were on, you talked about working in, walking into the first Blockbuster store. What year was that, Scott? 1990? 85. 85. 1985, you walk into this local video store. And what do you think? I, I remember you telling me this. I think maybe it wasn't yeah, well, on the I was, podcast. I, I, was, I walked into that store week one, day four, I was member 91 in the world. <laughs> a Blockbuster. <laughs> and I looked around and I said, this is really a good idea. There should be a lot of these. So wow. I jumped in and, 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 and partnered with them and ultimately became, you know, the president and chief operating officer to help that scale globally. Yeah. And you sold that, what, in the 90s like, yeah. to I, Viacom? I, we we so. sold that to Viacom in, in 90, uh, 93. That's right. So you've got, you've got experience with scale. Both of you do. And you mentioned this, I think it was you, Pat, earlier in the conversation today where you said, this is the opportunity for churches to really scale, like to really reach the world. And I mean, I've seen that. Welcome to my basement. I'm doing a podcast that has 13, 14 million downloads from my basement. Like it's crazy what can scale. I know a, a guy in Atlanta who scaled a virtual services company, $100 million in revenue in the last 10 years, and they don't have an office. He runs it out of his house. I've been to his house. So uh, church leaders are a little bit late to the party. Some of them are getting it. Like Elevation understands that. Life Church understands it. Fresh Life Church, many other churches understand it. Uh, but I want you to talk about scale and some of the principles behind scale, because I think most of the people listening to this podcast, they want to reach more people. I'm going to assume that they have a growth bias. So talk about scale and the possibilities of online ministry. Well, you know, when you think about your physical church, you know, the biggest ones get up to maybe physically, maybe up to 100,000 members. Yeah. Right. Campuses and so on like that. You know, I'm, do, I'm doing a our VM World Conference next week. Right. And I will have 200,000 simultaneous people participating. Wow. Right. You know, just, you know, you know, the largest stadiums built. Right. You know, can't hold that many people. Right. And you go think about it. And, you know, the events that we'll do, we're going to have maybe 10 million participants in different of the classes and labs and so on that we do. Right. Over the life of that material. Right. You know, and if you think about that, you're sort of saying, wow. Right. You know, imagine if I said to, you know, if you and I, Carrie says we wanted to be able to reach 100,000 people, let's go start by building the stadium church to go do so. You know, we only need to raise maybe a billion and a half dollars to go do so. Right. You know, that's nuts. That right. You know, nuts. you couldn't even dream of that business case. But to say we're going to go reach, you know, 100,000 people online today, that's sort of like, OK, you know, let's let's get our, uh, you know, uh, me media put together. That'll take a week. You know, and let's go get it up on uh, Facebook and let's go start some promotional activities. Great. You know, let's go have 100,000 people participate in this service. Right. You know, it's you know, the scale aspects that are possible now because, you know, everybody is connected. The cloud computing capacity is there to deliver it. Right. Uh, you know, and the social networks are already assuming that that's the case. Mm. Right. And then you can sort of say, huh, you know, I'm not limited by being an hour north of Toronto. Literally every human connected on the internet has now become part of my potential congregation, you know, that I can deliver this uh, message to, you know, the scale aspects. And again, this is only going to accelerate, you know, as I already noted, you know, 90% of humanity will be persistently connected to the internet by 2030. Wow. Right. You know, 10 billion people are part of your potential congregation. That is simply mind blowing uh, in its uh, potential. Right. And let's run the capital campaign to go reach those people, you know, or let's start building the product services and media outreaches, you know, social networks that allow us to reach those people. You know, that's the fork in the road that the church faces today. Well said. Scott, your thoughts on scale. I mean, you've just done it so yeah, many well, times. I mean, for sure. And, and I, I say yes to everything that Pat just said. And we've got to also bring technology to scale the one-to-one -one and the one-to-few interactions as well, right? Because ultimately within that, you know, 200,000 million person, 
you know, de facto congregation, what's really going to change is all of those one-to-one, one-to-few, you know, interactions. And how do you bring technology and scale to those personal growth core interactions within the context of that million congregation? Yeah. Right. Yeah. So yeah. it's 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 you've got to look at the scaling of the macro audience. And you got to look at the scaling of the micro yeah. interactions. Okay. Yeah. It's the one to the million as well as the million one to ones. Exactly. Mm. Yeah. That's the million one to ones, the million one to fews, and the one to millions. Right. And when you get all of that working, that's where you've got really the power to be able to scale because you got to, you know, scale a video rental transaction, one transaction at a time. Right. And then you got to scale that across lots of places. Right. So scale right. always starts with what's the core interaction that you're trying to scale. And it is that relational interaction. And how do you bring the powers of, like Pat said, computer processing, connectivity, AI, okay, intelligence to bring superpowers to those interactions? Wow. Yeah. And you're right. At the end of the day, it doesn't matter how many customers, you know, in the day Blockbuster had or, or a technology company has. If I have a bad experience, I'm, I'm checking out. And if I get forgotten in the shuffle, and that's what mega churches, I mean, as I've, I've, I've been, um, not every church is perfect, but, you know, mega churches that really grow and are effective have figured out how to get bigger, like fill that football stadium, not one at a time, but like, you know, thousand person rooms a hundred times on the weekend or 50 times on the weekend. Um, but, but they've done small group really well and personal interaction really well. The one right. thing I know at Connexus Church, our church, which is only 1500 people that's exploded during COVID is small groups, most of them right. virtual, right? It's that personal connection. People want to be connected, uh, not just watch a streaming message. So let's talk about people connect because that's something that I have, uh, uh partnered with the two of you on and with glue on to uh, help share with the wider church community, largely because I was so excited when you shared the idea, Scott. Um, I'm like, this is, this is a solution that I think is really going to help people. So what is a vision behind People Connect? Yeah, uh, People Connect is, is, is really a very simple idea. And that is, is that in this digital age, there are people out there that are coming to our web, the church websites, to the Recovery Center websites. There are people out there that are watching the streams and we don't know who those people are. And mm -hmm. so we've been able to put technologies in place to not only be able to understand the people in your community with using compliant big data, but also being able to understand the people that are actually at your website, at your, at your children's pages, to be able to then create compliant audiences and to be able to help run I love the collaborative nature of People Connect because everybody's contributing to a fund that then can run wonderful, beautiful PSAs about the idea that churches care, churches are relevant, churches are ready to serve you in, you know, hope for, you know, anxiety or hope for your relationship. Relevant things. So we run these beautiful PSAs using all the technologies, gathering all of those people and then we can connect them back to the right churches and to the right programs in a very simple, simple manner. So it's, it's, it's literally, you know, connect your website, fill out a profile and receive people that are, 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 are the right people for you. Well, it doesn't get any easier than that. But what happens in the background is now all of a sudden those churches are in a collaborative environment in terms of using cooperative data compliantly, using cooperative promotion in a great way that creates the right sentiment and using cooperative technologies, they get the economies of scale of all of that. Mm -hmm. Pat, anything you want to add to sort of the, the DNA of People Connect? Well, the thing, the thing, and I think uh, Scott touched on this idea, where all of a sudden, you know, everybody sort of says, boy, you know, if people can't come to my church, I got to go online. Right? But now every pastor is now speaking into this, you know, you're looking at this camera, you know, and you're lusting after that ability to get the reactions. Did mm -hmm. people hear me? Right. You know, when did they nod their head? You know, when did they flip open their Bible page? You know, you're lusting after that interaction that now 
right? This inanimate camera that you're trying to show your passion, right? Your, your humanity, right? You know, tell your stories through, huh? And I think everybody is struggling in this phase of how do I effectively connect? How do I get behind the camera, right? And now be able to reach, touch, and understand what's going on on the other side. You know, that's really what People Connect is trying to do. You know, we know now how to get our faces out to the internet, mm -hmm. right? You know, reach our churches that way. But how do we get to the other side of the camera and pull them in so that I have real feedback, real understanding of what's going on? And when I show up for next week, hell, I know I got reactions this week, right? To what I said last week. Now I know better how to connect with them. My small group leaders know what's happening on the other side. Yeah. You know, the entire team can start saying, oh, you know, you know, this digital thing isn't a bad experience because remember our objective in technology isn't to try to you know have a lousy form of what we did in the physical church it's to have a better form right of what we can now do online and digitally as well it's not one versus the other how do i bring these together to enable more people to hear the cause of christ and again i'll say the great commission wasn't a statement of how Right. You know, you know, we have to put on our sandals and go to every village. It was a statement of what make disciples and how do I reach to the other side of the camera to do that more effectively? Yeah. So let's break this down. There's really three stages, if I've got this right. And correct me if I'm wrong, but you embed a pixel on your website. So lots of sites do this. That's why, you know, if I'm shopping for a pair of shoes, I don't buy next time on my social media. It's like all shoes everywhere I look. Right. So that's just the way the Internet works. Um, but there's this pixel that sort of helps identify who that person is. And then there is a social media campaign, as you say, a PSA campaign. And it's white labeled. It's not labeled with your church, but it's a collective social media campaign um, where it might say, you know, struggling with loneliness or anxiety or, you know, whatever uh, that happens to be. But it's just basically a, a church's care kind of campaign. I, if I interact with that, that will give me an opportunity to identify myself, to say, yeah, I'm Carrie. I've been watching, you know, Connexus Church, and uh, I'm, I'm really interested, like, in, in finding out more about that church. And then I fill out my contact information voluntarily, and it gets delivered to that church's inbox with, like, hey, Connexus, meet Carrie. He's been watching your church online and would love to connect personally. Is that it? That's it. That's it. Okay. Now you have seeded, because the two of you have raised quite a bit of capital for glue, you have seeded uh, through private investment, the social media campaign with a million dollars of seed money. So it's already funded. And can you explain that? What is What, what does that buy you? Like that is something 99% of all churches, 99.9% .9 of all churches do not have the ability to do, to run a campaign at that level. Yeah, that's what we've done. We've seeded that 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 campaign fund with a million dollars. And what we do is we take 50% of the, let's say for a small church, $1,000. Yeah. We take 50% of that $1,000, $500. And now all of a sudden there's a million five hundred dollars in that campaign, gotcha. right? So the more churches that join, the more power in the campaigns, right? And right. then we bring Carrie back to a beautiful directory of that church. Hey, this is what this church is about in a really simple, clear, clean way. Okay. And to your point, connect them back into that church. But yeah, we fund, we seed the campaign. And then every dollar that's coming into People Connect, 50% of it goes to further add fuel to that overall campaign. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's, that's super clear. Um, how do, uh, yeah, uh, how have you funded glue? Like, have you got private um, people who are funding that or how does, how does this work out? Yeah, we, we, we funded glue. It's a private company. Uh, it is a for-profit company, which we think is, is, is really important so that we're able to access capital that wouldn't normally be available to the, 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 the church ecosystem. And we're not competing with the church for donation dollars mm. from the same people that they're, trying to get dollars from. Right. Okay. So we created it as a for-profit private company and it's been funded over the last 10 years uh, through a, a, a couple forms. Number one, uh, through uh, private investors like Pat and myself and Teresa and Linda, uh, as well as it's been um, funded by uh, revenue 
that comes in from the churches that are part of, you know, leveraging the services and, um, and, and the parachurches and the recovery centers that have been involved with us. Wow. Okay. That's great. So you have other investors who are like, they believe in it too. And, and they're trying to help. I also think that often the difference between profit and not for profit is you pay taxes or not. So, right. <laughs> That's it. It's just like everybody's for profit. If you don't make a, if you don't make a profit, you close your doors. Okay. <laughs> the only question is whether you're tax exempt or whether you're taxable, yeah. but everybody's yeah. got to make a profit. Right, right. You got to at least break even or else uh, or yeah. else the days are short, right? Yeah. yeah. No um, so you said there's a number of donors that have adopted a city by scholarshiping churches in a city. Can you talk more about that? Yeah, it's super exciting. Um, you know, all, all across the country, city movements have been organic movements for, yeah. for decades, right? You know, a bunch of people try to get together and they solve homelessness or foster care or you name it, you know, within, you know, you know, within, within a, a teen addictions within a city. Right. So what, what we're finding with, with, uh, with, with people connect is that donors in cities are really liking the idea of get, Hey, a hundred churches in my city leveraging people connect. So we can have these PSAs, these, these ad campaigns, these, these, these social, social media stuff. Yeah. Social media campaigns running not just at the national level, but also at the city level. So a little bit like, think about it like with Blockbuster, right? Right. At Blockbuster, we would have like, make it a Blockbuster night, you know? Mm -hmm. And we would run that across the whole country. And then Dallas would say, make it a Blockbuster night with the Dallas Cowboys, okay? Mm -hmm. And they would run that at the, at, 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 at the Dallas level, right? And then the store itself would say, hey, make it a Blockbuster night in Richardson, Texas, right? So- so that same capability is basically being leveraged here. And then, so these donors are loving the idea of catalyzing, you know, a sufficient number of churches in their geography, which does a couple things. Number one, it gets those churches going. Number two, it gets them all on a connected network, like Pat was saying. So now they're all connected to each other. And number three, those donors are actually being able to see um, what, what's happening on, on digital dashboards across those churches and across their city. And they are really, they are really going for it. Uh, we're really, we're really uh, uh, excited to see uh, people adopt cities and to be able to start being a catalyst for their city. I mean, Pat, he he knows he, you know, that transforming the bay is a city movement himself. I mean, he totally is 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 a a, a, a founder in that. Yeah. Anything you want to add to that, Pat? Yeah, I would say you know we, we have ours here. Right, which is one of when we came back to the Bay Area, I like to uh, joke that uh, you know God was uh, giving me the job of being CEO so I could have a platform to start TBC, transforming the Bay with Christ. Right, we're gonna you know uh, amplify works of service. We're gonna unify the Christian leadership. We're gonna multiply churches in the Bay Area. You know, today we have seven, eight hundred churches that are participating with TBC in the Bay Area, and uh, you know as I joke, you know this is the least uh, 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 it, it's the most influential area on earth. It's the least churched area yeah. in the nation. You know, it has the uh, largest per capita income on the planet and one of the lowest philanthropic rates in the nation. Wow. Okay. So I call it, you know, my mission field is rich, influential, miserly pagans. <laughs> <laughs> That's who I'm called to serve. That's so well said. Right? You know, here in the Bay Area. But as we think about that as well, this idea of city gospel movements and, you know, with a movement day with the Palau organization and Kevin Palau is on the board of TBC with me. It really is. How can we have the churches collective, right? You know, John 17, you know, that you would be one, right? You know, and really uh, bringing that idea together and then being able to combine that with data, right? And, uh, you know, glue and people connect. You start to say, how am I doing? What's being affected in my area? And everybody's learning from everybody, right? As they start to benefit from that uh, as well. What are the needs in this zip code compared to that zip code? And how has that gone? And all of a sudden you're really starting to be able to benefit by the community, by the philanthropy, right? Of the community saying, hey, let's uplift all of our churches in our area and really bringing about a gospel movement of a city, Right. And that really is exciting to us and Linda. And we've been uh, deeply invested in that 
uh, here in the Bay Area. As an example, we're connecting that up with uh, Glue in a very big way. Anything else you want to share about People Connect? Then I got one or two other questions. We're coming up on time, so I want to be respectful. You're both extremely busy, so thank you. No, I think you got it. I think you've got it. The It's just, you know, with, with technology, you're always working to try to get to simplicity on the far side of complexity, right? Yeah. Technology yeah. is really complex. And if you look at it, you know, what we've got to do and with what People Connect does is there's massive technology is underneath it, mm. but it gets it to super simple, right? Well, and you don't have to, you, like nobody individually can do what you guys have done. This is what gets me. Right. No, it, it takes, it's the collective, right? It is the connected, the connective tissue of the body, right? And that's, that's, that is the idea. Technology that allows the body to be the body ultimately. But it's about simplicity. And, and I think people connect is the best of both. That connectivity and the simplicity to be able to do the job, like Pat said, of get those people from being, you know, numbers on a screen to be able to be people that we've got relationships with and that we're helping grow. All right. So final question, I want to look to the future. One of the things I'm hearing over and over and over again, and here we are seven months into the pandemic, uh, and I get this almost every day from church leaders. It's like, Carrie, people are Zoomed out and screened out. Um, <laughs> I'm like... I, don't, I wouldn't bet the future on that. Any thoughts on where the future is going when it comes to technology and the church and how people behave? You've, you've touched on that already in different ways, but I want to close there because the degree of resistance to screens and so on is, is just fascinating to me. Let's, let's talk about the future and where we might be in a few years. Well, you know, the first I'd say is while, while there certainly are aspects to that, and what when I got a call from my uh, seven-year-old granddaughter complaining about how many Zoom sessions she was on for her school that day, right? It was sort of like, okay, now my seven-year-old is complaining about being, yeah. you know, Zoomed out, right? Uh, but have we started to leave social media? Are we doing less social media? Have, have you gotten rid of your Facebook account or, right, you know, the other ways? The answer is no, not by any means. And it's, you know, we've all, you know, we're, we're becoming very, very digitally connected in different ways. And now the question is, how's the church going to use that? Right? People aren't leaving these. And in the COVID era, yeah, we're a little bit numbed by it right now as we have lost all forms of physical connection, right? You know, as well. And, you know, maybe it's a year until we have a widely deployed uh, vaccine that's been well accepted. So we're still going to be here a while. Right uh, at that level, but it really is this question. And I just, I, I think you know, it, you know, was God on the throne in the great influenza? Yeah. Yes, He was. Yeah. Right, yeah. right. Yeah. You know, and it, it, you know, it's not a question of whether these things are going to come. What is God doing, right, in my church, in my community, in our nation, in our world, in this period of time? And I do think it's a kick in the butt, right, to the mm -hmm. church to say, embrace these opportunities, because my job isn't for you to build a big building. It is for you to reach people and embrace technology as an effective way to reach people at you know a scale, a capacity, right? You know, and maybe two, you know, just a little story, uh, Carrie. I was, uh, uh, you know, uh, one of my customers, big CIO for one of the big banks, right? He tells me, he says, "You wouldn't believe it, Pat. The board of directors directors brought me in and they gave me a standing ovation for how we responded to COVID." Right. When was the last time a CIO, right, you know, make the email work, gets a standing O from his board of directors, yeah. right? You know, the technology person, right, became the most important person to that business. Wow. Every church leader needs to think that same way as well. Who was your most important person? Was it your worship leader? Or maybe your small group leader, you know, maybe your executive pastor. No, your tech person needs the standing O because he's the most important person on your ministry team uh, at this point. You know, and our objective is just to help to give those people the tools that truly are going to take this dramatic period of human history when everybody's coming online right, and uh, participating to be able to truly hear the gospel of Christ wherever they are in whatever language they're in and connecting them up to the social fabric that will truly disciple them into the you know, God-chosen right, humanity that they would become like him. Mm. Scott, final word. Yeah, I, the, you know, 
COVID is is in 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 so many respects just leapfrogging us into the future, right? So many of these things were going to happen over time, but the social norms are always the hardest things to change. And what COVID did is it did a 360 or a 180 on the social norm. Okay. Mm -hmm. As it related to being in person versus to be on a screen. Hey, over the last two decades, church attendance already had gone from three times a month to one time a month. Yeah. Okay. So listen, there was already a gap that the churches weren't paying attention to. Correct. Paying attention to people in the gap between face to face times together is critical. Okay. Mm -hmm. It's like not only Sunday to Sunday, but that gap, what's going on on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, how are you encouraging? How are you helping? How are you being able to do all those things that, that, that Pat was talking about? And, you know, when they, when they go back, they're going to be going back once a month. They're not going to be going back four times a month, right? Yes. <laughs> yeah. 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 So, I, I would agree with that. I haven't talked to a single expert who would disagree on that in so, 2020. So, you know, just get your, get your arms around the idea of, you know, to, to, to Pat's point that we've got to have a bimodal approach. We got to have a digital approach and we got to have a face-to-face approach. And how do we bring technology to service in the gap between our face-to-face times together? You know, that's, what's got to happen. And not everybody can afford a full-time CIO. Yeah. And that's why glue yeah. is here. Okay. To be able to bring technologies and capabilities, economies of scale, and, and, and basically be that CIO in a box to be able to help those churches, um, you know, scale and to be all that they were created to be, help those pastors, you know, help the congregants, help the small group leaders. You know, we're just pumped. We're pumped for the moment. Um, It's been a a, a decade long journey that we've been on. And we feel like, you know, we've just gotten to the right place at the right moment. Um, And we're we're delighted to serve. I mean, I'm so grateful for uh, Linda and for Pat, uh, for their partnership, the people that we've got at Glue, our other board members, our other investors, you know, our employees and our partners, the churches that have been serving us and working with us as we've been serving them because they've been co-creating this with us, you know, and we're, 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 we're just grateful for that. Uh, I'm grateful for uh, also you, Carrie, in terms of what you're doing, in terms of being a voice uh, of leadership and, you know, our partnership with Barna and David Kinnaman. You know, it's just there, there's there's just so much that's coming together right now at, that that can get knitted together to be able to serve the church in a very unique and simple and powerful way. Well, I want to thank you. You've both been so generous with your time. Pat, thank you so much. Scott, thank you so much. Uh, where can people go to learn about People Connect? Is that just peopleconnect dot where can they find yeah, it? Peopleconnect.com or you can go to glue.us. Either okay. one of those people- will work. We'll link to everything in the show notes. Thank you both so very much. Absolutely. Well, I hope today's episode was helpful to you. You can always get more by subscribing to my channel. I also have a lot more content over at kerrynewhoff.com for leaders in business and leaders in churches. And uh, you can get transcripts of this episode there and so much more, plus some other stuff I do for leaders. So head on over there to discover more at kerrynewhoff.com. And in the meantime, I really hope our time together today has helped you lead like never before.